being here this morning. Those of you watching on the internet, Lorraine, I understand you're watching this morning. Uh, we pray for your health and we pray for uh, all of you that are here and watching that God will bless you during this season with not only good health, but uh, uh, with just some great joy. And it's a season of joy. I don't know if you read the comic strips. I often tell you there, now I'm up to eight that I read each day. I added the Argyle sweater. I strongly recommend it for anybody who wants to watch, read it. But this morning, the opening panel of Mr. Boffo, Genius is 99% perspiration, 5% inspiration, 10% imagination, 15% motivation, and 0% math. Um, <laughs> I, I thought that appropriate because this morning we're going to geek out a little bit in this class, if you don't mind. Uh, it's it's a, a lesson that that is important. It may not seem important to you, and if it doesn't, you can sleep through part of it, but, but pretend that you're not asleep because I don't want others to, to think I'm that boring. So with that, we're finding the Old Testament in the Gospel of John, and we've been working through it. We finished with the, the John chapter 7 with verse 52 last week. But all of a sudden we get to John chapter 7 verse 53 and there is an issue. There is an issue in the Bible that happens. Here I've got, if we go straight to the Elmo, we're going to get to the issue and pan it out quickly. Here we go. Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Issue. We are in chapter 7. Jesus is saying all of this. They reply to Jesus, are you from Galilee too? Search and see no prophet arises from Galilee. That's verse 52. And then we go to the next page. And we have this comment. The earliest manuscripts do not include 753 through 811. And then if you look at that footnote one, whoops, footnote one says some manuscripts do not include 753 to 811. Others add the passage here, which is where it is, 753 to 811, or after 736, or after 2125, or after Luke 21, 38, and these also have variations in the text. Now, when I was a student studying Greek, this was the edition of the Greek New Testament that we used in class. And, and if you flip to John chapter 7, in this Greek New Testament, you're going to see the following. It's got the story. There we are. This is 752. And uh, um, uh, you go from 752 to 753 and then chapter 8. And look, it's got these little brackets there. That's unusual. It's got the brackets and it's got a footnote 13. Now that footnote 13 is down here. Footnote 13, 752 to 811. And then it's got this long footnote that doesn't make much sense unless you've spent a lot of time reading these things. Now I've got to tell you, you've got to be really careful when you're studying Greek manuscripts or Hebrew manuscripts because they don't always... Um, all right, so one, this is a confession. It's good for the soul. There was a time in like third or fourth year Hebrew where I was supposed to prepare for these psalms. I was reading the psalms in Hebrew. And I was the only one in the class. So it's like me and the teacher. And I know I'm going to get called on for the whole hour. All I'm going to do is just sit there. I mean, it's not like he can call on anybody else. Though to my teacher's credit, on the first day of class, knowing it was only me, he asked me, and I understand Professor Miller's now deceased. God rest his soul. He asked me, yeah, Mike, 
You were the only student we've got. But that doesn't mean we're going to slack off and we're not going to do things any different than we would otherwise. I said, understood, Professor Miller. So let's start with the seating chart. Is that where you want to sit? <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. So there was one day where I was in a really bad hurry and I didn't have as much time to prepare as I had thought. I had left myself a couple of hours to get ready for the Psalms that I had to translate and I got up against this word and I'm really struggling with it and I can't figure it out. So I try to backwards engineer it. I can't figure it out. So I just got my Revised Standard Version Bible and I looked it up. And I thought, oh, yeah, I sort of see that. And I had it in here, but I didn't really have it, right? So then I go in there and there's an art to reading when you're not prepared to read. You want to read where it's clearly you're looking at it, you're thinking through it, and you're doing it. But you don't want to go so slow that you alert that you've got a problem there. You don't want to go so fast that it's obvious you just memorized the Revised Standard Version translation. So I'm working through it and I reach that word and I give my translation and I continue. And he says, st st stop, stop right there. I said, yes, sir. He said, where, where did you get your translation for the verb? And I said, well, and I start trying to reconstruct in my brain how this weak yod verb would be formulated in, in this text. Within, and, and so I give him my best answer. He says, no, the, the marks would be different. It would be blah, blah, blah instead. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So I, he says, so let me ask again. Where did you get your translation from? <laughs> So I make another go at it. And this time I'm kind of trying that backward engineering thing. And I'm saying, well, you know, it's a weak yod here. And so in the, the imperfect, you would, and, I, and I'm working through it. He goes, nice try. <laughs> that doesn't work either. And I said, it doesn't, does it? And he says, no. So let me ask you again. Where, where did you get your translation from? And I said, uh, and he says, may I make a suggestion? And I said, please, I'm clearly not getting it. I'm hanging out here. Help me. He says, you got it from the Revised Standard Version. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, clearly I did, which tells you I tried to get ready for class, but I couldn't figure it out. He says, so the question becomes, where did they get it from? And I said, yes, sir, please. He said, they used a variant reading. Now, a variant reading means they took the manuscript and instead of using the normal text that we use to translate the passage, they found an alternate version because they thought it made more sense. And if I had read these footnotes, I would have seen the alternate version and I could have said, the text doesn't make sense. Instead, I'm using the alternate version. Bam! I wouldn't have been caught. <laughs> Instead, I decided I need to go to law school. Clearly, I'm going to need to be a defense lawyer for my own crimes. <laughs> um, so here's the issue we've got. John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Where's it come from? Can we even remotely feel like when we read the Gospel of John, we've got the 100% original? Can we feel secure in what we're reading? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I drink Fiji water. My wife makes fun of me. I am convinced I can taste the difference blindfolded between Fiji water and any other water. And I know where it came from. 
the artesian springs of Fiji. I know that because it says it on the bottle. <laughs> and I have no doubt that it's authentic. But I asked the question, where did the Bible come from? I've got an English standard version of the Bible right here. Where did this come from? Now, a lot of people say, I don't care. It's from God, and that's good enough for me. And that's great, because you can have that assurance. And if you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't need to question this, I accept it, it's the Bible. God bless you, but you may have children, you may have grandchildren that don't think the way you think. And I can't tell you how many people go off to school and say, I have a professor who said there are all these mistakes and, and that we don't even have a reliable version and we don't even know what it is. And, and my mom and dad, they just automatically believe it. But I've got an inquiring mind. And I know better now. And so I think it's worth us spending a little bit of time in our post-Thanksgiving coma <laughs> to talk about where this came from. Now I want to put our scripture into perspective. So I want your help on this. If we look at a timeline of Western intellectual history. The United States of America and most of its educational system are part of Western intellectual history. There is a mixture of Eastern intellectual history as well. I don't mean to disregard that, but our biblical translations that we use have by and large come out of Western intellectual history. That's just the label. You don't like the label? Don't blame me. I was not a history major. I majored in Greek and Hebrew. So it's not my fault, okay? But let's talk about a timeline of Western intellectual history. What I want to do is divide it between two eras, B.C. and A.D. Now, if you are a Christian, you don't have any trouble understanding B.C. means before Christ. A.D. means Anno Domini, year of our Lord, is Latin translation. So that's, that's the common way we express that within Christian circles. If you step outside of Christianity and you look at those in academia or those within the Jewish faith that do not acknowledge Jesus as Christ, Messiah... They have a different system. They will call it BCE, standing for Before the Common Era, and CE for Common Era. The years align the same, but they use different terminology. We're at church. I can use BC and AD. Modern history. 1600s the date I've arbitrarily chosen because a lot of scholars do. You can subdivide modern history into the industrial age, the scientific age, uh, uh, um, all sorts, the computer age, all sorts of subdivisions. But we're just going to say modern history. The Renaissance, or if you're from Lubbock, the Renaissance, the Renaissance, I'm from Lubbock, the Renaissance state at generally different times, I'm grabbing 1350 up to the modern era. That was the reawakening or the rebirth of Western intellectual thought after the medieval times or the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, depending upon what you want to call them. Date it from about 410 here for me, the fall of Western Rome, not Eastern Rome the fall of Western Rome, up until the Renaissance, when people started um, being a little bit more intellectually curious. Art began finding its expression in a, in a new and fresh way, and, and society really starts moving along at, a, at an intellectual clip. 
Now, the, before the medieval time, we've got in Western thought, we've got the Roman Empire. Uh, the Romans have been around from 600 plus BC, but the empire starts really uh, with Julius Caesar, 30 BC, the date I've put there, that's just a rough estimate. Before the Roman Empire, you've got the Hellenistic Age, that's Alexander the Great, who took Hellenism, Greek, Greek uh, uh, is Hellenism, that's Greek, you can say Greekistic, Greekistic, yeah, that would work, but Hellenistic's the real appropriate term. Hellenism, Hellenistic history, that was the, the, the Western intellectual thought from about the time Aristotle, not Aristotle, uh, his student, Alexander the Great, took it and went around the, the Mediterranean world teaching people to speak Greek, to think Greek, and, and to be Greek. Before that, you've got the ancient Greek thought, which was more exclusive within the Greek area, but that ancient thought is uh, one that dates back to 750, even 850 B.C. You got it? I'm going to give you books to put with it so that you've got book marks for history. The ancient time will work back. Uh, so Homer writes the Odyssey around 850 to 750 and the Iliad, his two famous works. He writes those. Uh, you've probably read some of them. You're at least familiar with some of the stories um, um, the, the ship where Homer's sailing with, not Homer, where, uh, what's his name, the hero, Odysseus, thank you, is sailing, and, and they've got the sirens who, who lure the sailors over to the rocks with their beautiful song, and he wants to hear them, but he knows that, that it'll just be a shipwreck if he does, so he has them tie him to the mast, and he stuffs up the ears of all of the guys rowing so that they, they can't hear. And he just tells them to row near the island so he can hear the most beautiful song. And, and so, so many of the stories you would be familiar with, those are there with uh, Homer. The Hellenistic Age, Aristotle is, is kind of the writer in that transition period between ancient and Hellenistic. His uh, His predecessor was Plato. Plato's predecessor was Socrates. Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. Alex Aristotle wrote a lot of books for us that we've still got today. One of my favorites is his rhetoric, which teaches you how to argue and how to communicate and how to speak. It's uh, still a, a, a book you should read if you're a communication geek. The Roman period, Caesar's Gallic Wars is a good example. Gaul was the territory north of Italy that's now kind of eastern France, um, um, uh, western Germany, southern western Germany. Uh, we've got Charles and Amy Cross here. You, they were missionaries in France. Uh, they, they were in, in old Gaul. And, and that was an area that Caesar conquered. He crossed the Rubicon. He came, he saw, and he conquered. Winnie, witty, wicky. And, and, and that's the story that he wrote about his conquering of, of Gaul, Gallic Wars. If you take second year Latin, it's typically what you read. So we've got that. Uh, medieval stuff, the Vulgate is what I've grabbed here because it was written at the beginning. Not a lot of stuff written during the medieval times that's worth grabbing. Uh, there are a few things. Uh, Boethius, the Consolation of Philosophy, Sarah read in school. That was uh, Middle Ages. Um, uh, but the Vulgate is the Latin translation of the Bible. Jerome didn't make Pope. And so he goes off to a cave in, in Israel and, and spends his days translating the Bible into the common tongue. Common tongue in Latin, vulgar, is vulgar, is the way we pronounce the, the hard V, vulgar. And so the common tongue, the vulgar tongue, is what produced the Vulgate, the Bible in common language, which was Latin. Uh, the Renaissance uh, could have done a lot of different things here. Dante is, is kind of that cusp. He's, he's a literary giant coming into the Renaissance. But I put up here Erasmus because Erasmus was really concerned with trying to not just have his Latin text, but trying to figure out what the Greek was that Jerome originally used 
to translate the Latin. So Erasmus is someone, a, a notable intellectual compatriot. Another one, Martin Luther. And so you can look at Luther's commentaries, his writings, and things like that. Those are Renaissance thinkers. And then the modern age, right now for me, uh, uh, I've held up the Bible, the English Standard Version of the Bible, 1611, the King James Version. So those are books that help you with each of these timelines, okay? Now, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to talk to you and make sure we're all on the same page about the ancient ways of making books. Originally, in biblical times, in the time of Jesus, they didn't really have books. They just had parchment, papyrus, or, or animal skins, and they would buy and then or prepare and then write on this. Papyrus, they'd take the reeds out of the Nile or wherever they'd get them, and they'd slice them long ways like this and then they press them together into with they kind of have a pasty effect and they would press them and then they'd put one set this way and then another set this way crosswise and that's how they would produce papyrus sheets and then they could write on them it was not until about the time of of new testament writings that books started becoming common before that, you just have parchment pages, or you might have something tied up, uh, uh, sewn together to make a scroll. But up till then, the Old Testament, for example, would be a collection of scrolls. And so books become more common and often are generally assumed to have taken hold because of Christianity. Because people wanted something where they could easily flip and didn't have to carry around 60, 70 scrolls. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a little background. If you wanted to go back and find an ancient copy machine, that would not be it. That is not an ancient copy machine. That's a modern copy machine. Here's the ancient copy machine. The ancient copy machine was really good for producing one copy at a time. I could sit there and I could have the text here and I could have my copy machine here and I can reproduce what the text says. In the beginning was the word and I can write it down. There's a problem with that. It takes a long time. So if you want to make many copies, if we go back to the PowerPoint please, if you want to make a lot of copies, it does not serve you to do one copy at a time, we've lost the PowerPoint. Um, if it comes up, great. If it doesn't, oh, look at that. I found a picture of how they made many copies at once. Are you ready? <laughs> That's it. Here's what they would do. I would say, all right, one for Wilkie. One for Jan, I'll just go down the row here. Sharon, you get one. Miss Carolyn, you get one. Castell, give one to your cousin. We get it all done. Larry's got one. You know, we're just going down the row and I'm going to pass them all out and everybody gets a pen. And then I'm going to say, okay, time to make copies. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all of y'all write at the same time. So I get 30 copies made in the time it took me to read instead of just doing one. Isn't that brilliant? Do you see the problems? The problems is I'm looking out there, and some of y'all can't spell very good. <laughs> and I already know I'm going to talk about the principle of this, that, or the other, and y'all are going to sit there, and some of you are going to spell it right, and others are going to say, well, now, is that principle A-L or L-E? Uh, the principal at my school is my pal. That's A-L. And you're going to work through that, and you will have missed an entire sentence that I've read while you're trying to figure out how to spell principle. And then some of you are just going to misspell it. That's just all there is to it. You're going to spell the wrong word. And it's going to happen. And the worst part about it is, after I collect your 30 manuscripts back from you, and I've got my 30 
copies of the Gospel of John here. I'm going to hand them to these monasteries and these churches all over the place. And then they're going to say, hey, we need some of these for our members. Let's write out another copy. And they're going to take your mistake and they're going to reproduce it. And make a few of their own. And then someone who's got the original somewhere is going to wind up spilling their milk on it. Because they're reading it over breakfast and they've got their Cheerios and they're just not as steady with their hand as they used to be. Or they're bringing it up to them and it slops all over it. And once you get moldy Cheerios and milk on the papyrus sheet, it starts rotting. And so the originals get gone. Documents only last so long. And so, how reliable are these things we read? You know, let's go back to these ancients. Um, Homer writes the Odyssey and the Iliad. You want the oldest complete text of that? He writes it 750 to 850 BC. Oldest complete copy is of the Iliad. It's older than what we've got of the Odyssey. Here it is. There's a picture of it. It's called Vanitas A. The manuscript was written in the 10th century A.D. That's over 1,800 years after Homer wrote. And that's the oldest complete copy we've got. How many errors do you think were made in 1,800 years of people slopping Cheerios on it? Now, that's not the oldest fragment. That's the oldest complete copy. You want the oldest fragment found last year, 2018. They found a piece of clay that has inscribed on it 13 lines of the Iliad. 13 lines. Do you know when it was punched onto that clay? 3rd century A.D. It's still over a thousand years after Homer wrote. Give you another example. Do it real quick. Um, Aristotle. If you want to look at Aristotle, the oldest fragments we've got, we've got some fragments of some of Aristotle's writings, but all but three of the fragments we've got, all but three of them date after 1000 A.D. Those three date from around 7, 750 is the earliest, A.D. Everything we've got is over a thousand years more recent than he wrote the original. Caesar's Gallic Wars, we've got 10 old copies, but they were all still written over a thousand years after Caesar wrote Omnes Gales Est Divisa and Partes Tres. All over a thousand years later, we got 10 copies. We're doing the best we can. So let's throw those up there and let's compare them to what we've got with the Bible. The New Testament alone is what I'm going to talk about today. We'll talk about the Old Testament sometime when we want to geek out on it. The Greek New Testament. If you want to look at old manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, you don't have 10 like you have 10 Latin transcripts for Caesar's Gallic Wars. If you're looking at manuscripts and fragments of the Greek New Testament, we've got ancient ones now, over 5,600 copies. Some of them just small passages, fragments, some of them much longer, some complete. The oldest ones, if you take the the, the, the most aggressive dating, academically fair, is a fragment of the Gospel of John that was found in Egypt. 
that dates around 115 A.D. Remember, John wrote his gospel around 90 to 95 A.D., by my perspective. That's within 20 to 25 years of when he wrote it. Say, so, yeah, but that's just a small piece. Actually, it's a two-sided piece. So you've got some of the passages from both sides, but even a small piece will tell you how accurate your text is because you're able to tell from the size of the paper and everything else how much more data there would have been, what's there, what's not there. If you open it up and you say, I want to look at the New Testament, but not simply in Greek, because I know it was translated into Syriac. I know it was translated into Latin. I know it was translated into Palestinian Aramaic. I know it was translated into other languages early. We've got over 19,000 copies of the Greek New Testament translated into other languages. That's an amazing amount of material from which we draw great conclusions about what is authentic and what is not. And there's, there are seven passages where there might be a serious debate about whether or not it was authentically in the original. And that's it. And I'm talking not about, this isn't, oh gee, what if for God so loved the world is not in the original or for by grace you have been saved through faith is not in the No, none of that. This is stuff... That, that doesn't make a whit of difference in your theology. Not one whit. So let me take this and let's look at it from the opposite end. Let's turn this uh, around, okay? So there. It, <laughs> that does not make more sense. So we're going to do it this way instead. We'll start with the ESV. The ESV was first published in 2001, the English Standard Version. That's the version I like, and that's the version I use most of the time. But before that came out, the version I used was one I was given in high school. When I graduated from high school, they just published the New International Version for the first time, 1978. And that New Testament they gave us at church as a high school graduation gift. And I used that for a long time. Before that, I used the New American Standard Bible as my general go-to reference. And before the New American Standard, oh, by the way, somebody out there is being real tricky and they're saying, wait a minute. If you used the New International Version, then why, when you were translating the Psalms, did you go to the Revised Standard Version? Because the NIV was only out in the New Testament. The Psalms are in the Old Testament. It wouldn't have helped me. Didn't have it yet. Um, New American Standard Version is what I used before that. That came out in 1963. And before that, I used the King James Version. And that came out in 1611. Well, not really. Not the way you and I read it today. Because you see, all of these editions have constantly improved as newer discoveries were made of the original texts. So when King James translation comes about, they didn't have all of these Greek manuscripts that were discovered in the coming centuries. They're missing. Big, in fact, there are parts of the King James that they just didn't have a Greek manuscript for at all of any merit. So they translated it out of the Latin, which was a translation of the Greek. If you are someone who believes that God magically put on the, the, the pen in the hands of the King James translators and that it is God's divine version, with all due respect, you're just wrong. There's just no way. Now, did God, is God behind this? Has God used this? Is this good? Absolutely. But the King James version is not without error. It's reliable. It's something we can all go to the bank on, if you will, just like these other versions. But this has been a problem for a long time. Look, I brought you the, can we go to the Elmo for just a moment? This is the latest Greek New Testament. Here's the Greek New Testament edition that we used when I was in college. This was my textbook, okay? This one just came out. This Greek New Testament is the latest and greatest produced at Tyndall House, Cambridge. They went back through and they took the most 
thorough examination of the entire Greek New Testament and compared all of the different manuscripts that we possibly have to come up with the most reliable Greek manuscript for people to use today. It's really amazing. Now, I'm going to show you something that I, I thought twice about bringing up because I don't mean it in, in any... Um, this, this is not about me. This is just a credibility thing. So accept that. In the back, they give acknowledgments to all of the people who worked really hard to make sure this was right. And there are some amazing people. This is Dirk Jonkin and Peter Williams, Peter Head, Jonkin, excuse me, Dirk. Um, these guys worked really hard on it. And then they got a bunch of help from other people for the research. Many individuals helped in research, including Ann Burberry. I don't know who that is. Coakley, I'd never heard of him. Hare, uh, I'd, I'd like to keep mine. Uh, Kenyon, I don't know. Ooh. <laughs> Must be on the front row. <laughs> now, I'd love to tell you I did something really, really significant here. I really didn't. Um, what I did is help make sure that Epaphroditus had his name spelled correctly because some manuscripts have an I in it and some don't. And his mother cares. <laughs> and so do I. And I had another few, few projects. But even on something as small as the spelling of Epaphroditus, who's mentioned three times in the Greek New Testament, that's a focus area. And some of the, the work that, that, that we did going through all of these manuscripts is incredible. But I show you that to tell you that this is an editing process that's been going on forever, it seems. And I want to have credibility when I tell you this. I didn't get this stuff off the internet. This is from four decades of trying to dig through this stuff myself, okay? So here's one of my favorites I want to show you. This is a page. And we've got a facsimile of this page in the, uh, actually of the entire book. This is from something called Codex Vaticanus. Codex means book. Vaticanus means this book's in the care of the Vatican. It is a copy of the Bible in Greek that dates from the 300s, probably the end part of the 300s. In the early part of the 300s, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, ordered 50 copies of the Bible to be done with the best manuscripts they had. Two of those, we believe, are still around today. Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. This would be one of the two. Now, some scholars say, no, it's not. Some say, yes, it is. We don't, I mean, it doesn't have stamped on it. I got paid to do this by the Emperor Constantine. But this is what you've got. Now, if you look, the first column on the left is the end of 2 Thessalonians. And 2 Thessalonians ends at the bottom of that page where I've got the six. And then up at the top where I've got the two by that long bar, that's where Hebrews 1 starts. If you skip down to the eight that I've got highlighted there. Do you see this fuzzy writing down the side? Let me pull it out for you. That fuzzy writing right there. That's it on the side. By the way, if you're looking at saying, where do the words end and where do the words start? They didn't put spaces between words. And before paper was cheap, you wouldn't either if you had to buy a new sheet every time you ran out. Now, Here's what that says in Greek, if I reproduce it for you. It says, uh, te, they didn't do a dash, but the amathes you see there and the tate are all one word. Kai, kake, afes, ton, palaion uh, is all one word, even though it's on two lines. Me, metapoie is, metapoie is one word too. That's what it says. Someone wrote that in the margin of the Bible. Can I translate it for you? You ignorant and evil fellow, forgive the error, don't change it. <laughs> Here's why this person felt the drive to make that note. 
Here you see the word phanerone. Phanerone, phaneros means uh, 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 something made clear. Okay? That's not what was in the original of Hebrews. We know because it doesn't make as good a sense, but even moreover, we've got other copies. We know it's not what was in the original. The original had that first, uh, uh, the, the phi there is, is the circle with the slash through it, that first letter under my overline. And then next to it is an A, and then an N, and then an E, and then that P looking letter is an R, and then the W is an O, and then an N, phonerone. Now here's the problem. The real word there is the PH, that first letter, but the second and third letter don't belong there. It's just pharaon. From the Greek verb to carry. And it means that God has carried or brought. Or uh, uh, the ESV translates it as uh, uh, he upholds. He carries. He holds. The universe by his power. By the power of his word. All things he upholds. Tetapanta. He upholds all things by the power of his word. That's what the original said. But someone copied it wrong and maybe they'd had a little too much mate to drink and they were a little shaky or something and they read uh, Theron and, and thought it said Phaneron. And they added the A-N. Which means it's clearly seen by the power of his word. All things are clearly seen by the power of his word instead of upheld. Okay? Some scholar on this book 1,650 years ago or since then kind of etched it out and fixed it. Fixed the mistake. And then another scholar or monk comes along and fixes it back. Puts the error back in there and in the process says, you ignorant and evil fella, forgive the error, don't change it. So this is the stories that we've got. And that is why when you're reading along in John and you're reading John 7, 1 through 52, you read about Jesus' suit coat, which is what we did last week. And then John 8, 13 and following, you're reading about Jesus' suit coat, as we will next week, God willing. But wedged into the middle is this story from John 7, 53 to 8, 12 of a woman caught in adultery. And the story's genuine. This is Jesus. It just didn't go there. We don't know where it went. God has secured it. Look, we know this story was, was used and talked about and referenced as early as the 300s because a, a, a Christian scholar named Didymus the Blind references it. And so do others in other translations. We just don't know where it went. It's been placed in these different places in all of the old manuscripts. So we put it into a footnote. Or we put it there with a footnote and say most old manuscripts don't include it. And those that do will include it over here or over there or different, different edits of it. It's not going to change your theology, but it sure is going to encourage you. And you can see why the, the church has ensured that we've got this. The Holy Spirit in the church has ensured we've got it. It starts out with Jesus leaving and going over to the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. And let's look at the story together for just a few moments because uh, uh, there's really some really nice touches in this story that we need to, to walk home with. So John chapter 8 starts in actually 7, uh, 53. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. That's the camera angle I showed you was Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. It's just down the valley, back up on the other side, uh, uh, Mount of Olives. Huge cemetery there now. Um, early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple, went back down, came back up. All the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him. Now we need to stop for a minute. 
I want to turn lawyer on you. I'm going to see something here. See if this works. Yes. I want to turn lawyer on you. I'm bothered by this story already. I'm bothered by the behavior of these people. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Caught is, a, in the Greek, it's, it is a continuing action. It's, it's, it's in the perfect uh, uh, tense. And it, it's, it, it means she was probably a serial adulteress. But caught also means that these were eyewitnesses. These were not people who just said, hmm, I suspect she's committing adultery. Let's test it to see. These are people who had first-hand knowledge. Which means one of two things. Either the other person involved in the adultery is one of the accusers. Witnessed it because he was there doing it. Or they visibly saw the copulation. Those are the really only two choices you can come up with. And I'm really bothered by the fact that not only did they really eyewitness it, but they only brought the woman. It takes two to tango and two to commit adultery. Where's the man? They didn't even have to bring the woman. They could just test Jesus. They're doing this to test him. Jesus, we caught a woman in adultery. Law commands us to stone her. What should we do? They could have just asked him. But no, they march her in. This woman, they've got her. They placed her in the midst, in the middle of all of them. They surround her and they say to him, Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Jesus is a lot cooler about this than I would have been. I would have said, well, that's not quite what the law says, hot shot. Leviticus 20, verse 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Doesn't say stone. It says both of them. And I'm sorry, I keep reading this, and they didn't bring the man. They let him go. So they do this to Jesus to test him. That they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bends down and writes with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. I mean, they bring him the test case. They've got the woman. They stick her in the midst. Jesus could tower over her. Jesus could sit and point his finger. Instead, Jesus bends down and starts writing with his finger in the dirt. And if you read different scholars, they'll tell you different things they think he was writing. Some think he was writing the passage out of Leviticus. Like, where's the guy? You know, circling that. 
Some think he's writing the passage out of the law about entrapment and how you shouldn't entrap someone to sin because they must have set her up. Some think he was writing down their sins. Like, yeah, uh uh-huh, that's fine, but I know what you did. I'm going to write it down right here. And so they start kind of like, I'm I'm out of (laughs) here. I don't think the point of the passage is what he wrote, or we know what he wrote. The point of the passage is he wrote with his finger. Do you know why that's the point of the passage? They're quoting the law to Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, who is God. And the law... Genesis, Exodus 31 tells us God gave to Moses when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Don't start playing Bible trivia with the Lord, <laughs> you will lose. Moses told us to stone this woman. The law, Moses commanded us. The law wasn't written by Moses. The law was given to Moses by God. The commandments were written on a stone by the finger of God. Jesus is writing those commandments, not Moses. So there in the midst is the woman who's been caught in adultery. And Jesus pronounces the just result. Let him who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. And then he continues to write on the ground as they fade away. Was there anybody there? Anybody in that entire crowd? That whole scene? Anybody? who had the right justly to stone or kill that woman, to throw that first stone. Is there anyone there without sin? Yes. Jesus. And he's the only one left. They went away one by one, and Jesus was left alone with the woman. So what's Jesus going to do? Is he going to pick up the rock and chunk it at her? Is he going to condemn her? Is he going to kill her? Or is he going to forgive her? And with true, genuine love that this woman may never have experienced in her life, tell her what she needs. Has anyone condemned you? Where are they? She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Now, go on, and from now on, stop this. Do right. You can do better than this. And that's what Jesus tells her. So if we go to the PowerPoint, we've got to go. I've taken too long and I apologize. But here's your food for home. (laughs) Point number one, we can rely on Scripture. People have spent lifetimes making sure we've got Epaphroditus' name spelled right. Number two, Jesus authored our forgiveness. He's not here to condemn you. He's here to give you life. He's here to bring you life. Not an ignorant life where he ignores what you've done. One where he knows everything you've done. And he says to you, I'm here to forgive you. I didn't come to condemn you. Jesus, if he wanted to condemn the world, he didn't have to come. The world was already condemned. John 16, 33. No, 3, 33. Sorry. Jesus authored our forgiveness and then Jesus instructs us on how we ought to live. So that's the interlude. Next week we'll pick back up with Sukkot and we'll finish it in John chapter 8. Can I bless you? And I'm sorry I kept you late. 
Father, thank you so much in the name of Jesus. I pray a blessing of forgiveness, of reassurance, of faith, and of holiness upon all who hear your word. Thank you for the countless lives of unknown people who have given of themselves to ensure that we can read your words today with confidence and security. We pray through the name of Jesus. Amen. See you guys next week.